I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zenner and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Local groups have joined forces to form Northland Healthy Minds to reduce stigma and raise awareness of mental health resources. We'll continue our look at local organizations helping to raise up impoverished communities. This week we focus on the Ordeen Foundation. And in our final video letter home, Lieutenant Commander Roger Reinert is back in the United States soil after deployment in Afghanistan. We'll have these stories in the business news next on Almanac North. Hello again and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. And it's starting to look and feel a little bit more <laughs> like spring around the region, Julie. I don't know. I hear there's also uh, some danger of snow coming up in the uh, next couple of days. Hopefully so not I, up into I'm our I'm hopeful area. but not confident. Okay, right. <laughs> Time to introduce our first guest. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Denny, and welcome, everyone. Northland Healthy Minds is now in its second year working to reduce the stigma around mental illness. With the month of May recognized as Mental Health Awareness Month, Northland Healthy Minds has a number of events planned to raise awareness. Joining us now is Larissa Sandreski, coordinator of Northland Healthy Minds, and Emily Anderson is the Community Health Program Manager with Essentia Health. And thanks to both of you for being here tonight. Appreciate you coming in. Thanks for having us. Larissa, maybe you could start by telling us about your group and this collaboration that's come together. Sure, so Northland Healthy Minds started mm -hmm. in 2017. Um, it was really initiated by the city of Duluth. They took on the Make It Okay campaign, which is a campaign to just make it okay to talk about your mental health and mental illness, make it okay to seek help, um, and make it okay to just have that conversation. So mm -hmm. once they started, a lot of um, other organizations, businesses, and um, government agencies were interested in getting involved. So really a grassroots group was kind of built around it um, and we started meeting monthly in 2017 and it's really grown from there. So, Emily, after all these years, why do you think there's still a stigma when it comes to seeking help for mental health? Yeah, I think, I mean, it has to do somewhat with the culture around it and just it's so much easier to talk about, you know, if you have cancer, you have some yeah. other disease to just be able to talk about that and when someone tells you they are struggling with that, it's so much easier to offer help or want to ask more questions, where a lot of times people shy away from questions around mental health more. So that's what we're really trying to do is just build more compassion. Are we getting better at that? Um, you know, last year we were able to engage a lot of people in this work and just have seen a, a lot of businesses helping with this among their workers. Um, and the schools are getting really involved in doing a lot with youth, so that's been really great mm -hmm. to see. Good. Mm -hmm. Larissa, why do you think that mental illness is such an uncomfortable topic for people to talk with to each other or, or to share with somebody if they're struggling with it? Uh, I think there's a lot of stigma around and misunderstanding of what having a mental illness means uh, for somebody's life, a lot of stereotypes. I, I know when people have shared, you know, years ago when I heard that one of my friends had considered commit like um, suicide I, I was so shocked and I had no idea what to say and it was just like you know what how do I respond to this how what does this mean for a friendship and I think um, we're just not equipped to deal with that and nobody talks about it and I think we just need to realize that a lot of people go through these issues and it's just one piece of who you are and we just need to open is, so is, is mental illness more common than maybe some folks might believe yeah, yeah. one in five people um, mm -hmm suffer from mental illness. Do you think most people at some time in our lives go through periods of mental illness? Sure, so I think there's a difference between mental illness and mental health too and just kind of everybody has things they need to do to take care of their mental well-being the same way we do for our physical health but then there all are also mental illness conditions so everybody's been um, probably at some point impacted by someone in their life at least yeah. having mental illness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Larissa, you said that it was hard for you to yeah. talk with a friend. Uh, the Make It Okay campaign, offer some tips. Yeah. Just in terms of, of language. 
and you know w how you should talk, what you should say, what you shouldn't say when talking to somebody. Can you share just a little bit of that information with our, our viewers? Yeah, I think it's important to note that Emily and I aren't experts in mental health, and most people mm -hmm. in our group are not experts in mental illness, and you don't have to be to respond compassionately to someone. So some of the things that are recommended by the Make It Okay campaign is just to say, thank you for sharing. That must be so difficult. What can I do to help? I'm mm -hmm. um, just expressing your love and care for that person even when they're going through this difficult time. Um, some less helpful things might be like, it'll get better, uh, you know, it's, it can't be that bad. You'll, you'll, you'll get through it. That kind of just brushing it off is, is less helpful. Mm -hmm. Emily, what are some signs of mental illness? Um, yeah, like Larissa said, I don't think that we're really the mental health experts to talk about that, but I hope that some of our events this May will be able to bring a lot more um, education to our community on those mm -hmm. different things. Mm -hmm. okay. Talk about some of those events that are coming up, because you really have a, a full slate of activities um, to appeal to almost everyone and get everybody involved. Yeah, this year we have a big focus on art and mental illness. And so um, starting next Thursday on uh, May 2nd, there's going to be a kickoff event at Zeitgeist from 5 to 7, where we um, have Barb Kellogg is a photographer, and she has her art uh, displayed called What Mental Illness Feels Like. Um, so that will be on display at Zeitgeist throughout the month of May. The other one that we're really excited about is Sam Militich is coming, who is a musician from Grand Rapids. He's a jazz musician who uh, lives with schizophrenia. Mm. And so he will talk about you know his recovery process and how his creativity and music plays a role in that. It's um, He's supposed to be a really amazing musician, and so we're excited to have him in Duluth. And um, again, just really like ta showing it's normal people that have mental illness, that um, it's possible to live in recovery and um, hope is available. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, that is on May 14th at Denfeld from, is it 5.30? 5.30, yep. Mm -hmm. I understand there's also a, a Wear Green Day. Yeah, so we did this last year too. May 9th is Wear Green Day, and green is kind of the mental health awareness color. So um, if you can just wear green at your job or with you know your organization and snap a photo and send it to us to share on social media and we're giving away a goodie bag for um, just a random recipient yeah. of so know. what kind of resources then are out there to help people in areas of mental health so um, there's NAMI's website has a long list of all the different resources that you can call there is a hotline and a website also called let's talk Minnesota um, that has 24-7, you know, calling, and so anybody can ask for help at any time. Um, Birch Tree also has a lot of really good resources as well, obviously Essential Health and um, mm -hmm. St. Luke's and a lot of our other partners that are mental health providers. Mm -hmm. What about uh, tools that maybe would help employers or organizations kind of start having these discussions within their organizations? Yep, we have an employer toolkit on mm -hmm. our website. So we have, I think, about 30 or 40 businesses already signed up that mm -hmm. are going to be implementing that over the month of May. So it just has, it has even pre-made newsletters that you can send out to your employees, um, you know, videos that you can share or watch together on your lunch break that just kind of show what the experience of living with a mental illness is like. So there's a lot of good resources in that toolkit. It, um, I think some local employers have their own resources as well. So, you know, at Essentia Health, we're going to be really promoting our employee assistance lines and just our different stress reduction uh, toolkits and things like that that are available to employees because it is a high stress job with a lot of grief and um, so we have a lot of those unique resources that we're really going to be just trying to make sure our employees are aware of during the month of May so each organization is sort of able to target it um, to their specific resources mm -hmm. as well. Is it a good idea for someone who is struggling with mental health issues to be open about that with their employer? Sure, yeah, or uh -huh. friends, family. I mean, yeah. I think that is part of the stigma that it's not about necessarily having to go see a mental health provider, but if we had a really caring, compassionate community where you feel like you can um, you know, share and just get that help and support yeah. you need from others Talking is you. vitally important, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yep, yeah. exactly. All right, well, thank you for coming in and talking with us about it. We also will have uh, your website up on the screen so that people can get more information about Mental Health Awareness Month and some of the activities that you have planned. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you.
featuring video letters home from U.S. Navy Reservist Roger Reinert, who's been deployed in Afghanistan. Well, this weekend, Reinert will be finally returning home after many months in a combat zone. He sent us this final video letter home after reaching Norfolk, Virginia. Hi everyone, uh, Lieutenant Commander Roger Reinert sending you what will be my final video letter home. So as you can tell by the blue water behind me, I'm no longer in Qatar, uh, where I was the last time I gave you an update. I am now in Norfolk, Virginia. After Qatar, uh, flew to Germany and was there for four days, uh, basically just decompressing uh, and practicing being a civilian again. So we got to do things like wear civilian clothes, uh, not shave every day, uh, and even made a couple of small trips where literally the goal was, hey, go where you want, uh, buy the food that you want, uh, just practice being a civilian again, making those kinds of daily decisions that we haven't had to make for, uh, for months since we've been deployed. From there, we then flew to Baltimore. So that's the first place that I set feet in the United States and uh, then down to Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, so the command here, ECRC, Expeditionary Combat Readiness Center, owns all the Navy individual augmentees that go overseas to Iraq and Afghanistan. And so I'll be here seven, ten, maybe a few more days uh, as we do things like medical, uh, administrative paperwork, all those things necessary to take me from being an active duty sailor back into a reservist. Uh, and then finally, we'll fly commercial from here back home to Dulu. So I just want to say thank you to all of you that came along on this journey. Um, and hopefully it, it helped you give some appreciation to the thousands of Guard and Reserve that are forward deployed every day. Uh, and a special thank you to WDSE for doing this. Now on another subject, all month we've been featuring conversations with local organizations that work to make the future brighter for young people living in poverty. Examples of efforts here at home and around the country have been featured in the national series, Our Kids Narrowing the Opportunity Gap, airing Friday night at 9 p.m. on PBS North. Duluth Sardine Foundation is one of the groups that works to address the root causes of poverty and disparities in our community. You're here to tell us more is Don Ness, Executive Director of the Ordeen Foundation. Welcome, Don. Good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, what's the mission, Don, of the Ordeen Foundation? Well, Albert Ordeen was a very prominent uh, business person uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s in, in Duluth, a prominent banker and mm -hmm. owned a, a grocery distributing business. And he had the foresight back in the 1920s, still the go-go 20s, uh, that he wanted his uh, fortune to be used to address poverty issues uh, in, in Duluth. And this was before the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but he said it's important that these uh, resources are used in a non-discriminatory basis and really looking at the root causes uh, of poverty in our, in our community. He was really ahead of his time, wasn't he? I, it, you know, he is a remarkable person. Not only the success that he had in business, uh, his civic-mindedness, yeah. and the long-term thinking that, that he had, seeing uh, opportunities for the city of Duluth that may not have been evident to many in that time, but have paid great dividends over many, many decades. Mm -hmm. As we mentioned in the introduction, we've been talking about children in poverty for the last few weeks. Uh, as a former mayor and now head of the Ordeen Foundation, where do you see the the biggest opportunity gaps for kids who are in poverty? You know, I think what we see so often is, uh, you know, there are so many uh, of these these gaps that are necessary to address. But in, in our minds, it's the health of the family, uh, the family unit uh, that is so critical to giving the, the kids the opportunities that, uh, that will make them uh, successful in, in life. And if you imagine the, the experience of people that are struggling in poverty, and oftentimes single family, uh, um, uh, single parent families, uh, and the amount of stress and anxiety that goes into just uh, you know, paying the bills and, and uh, caring for their children and putting food on the, on the table, 
uh, much less the stresses that, as a parent, I know how difficult it is. We have two families, yeah. uh, two parents, and and uh, many advantages, and and it's still difficult. And so, uh, so many of these uh, these kids are are in a place that they don't have the su support at home just because of all the stressors there. So uh, that's when bringing other adults into uh, the equation, uh, addressing out of school uh, time, uh, organizations like the Boys and Girls Club and Neighborhood Youth Services uh, and Mentor Duluth that connects uh, these young people with, uh, with other adults. So are we getting to the root causes of poverty? Well, I think we try to address both. You know, we have to make sure that we're addressing uh, those core needs, you know, food, shelter, and clothing, yeah. as well as what we uh, say at Ordina is trying to get upstream and looking for uh, those opportunities to make sure that it's not a multi-generational pattern that, that takes place. How, what can we do for those kids uh, to get them on a path uh, that they can make a better life for themselves? Would Mr. Ordean see some changes today compared to maybe when he was uh, a, a younger man? Well, there's certainly many changes uh, when you look at uh, the city that Duluth was. And, you know, in, in the 1920s, uh, Duluth had seen uh, uh, tremendous growth. It was also a, a city at that time uh, that had uh, a majority of foreign-born residents uh, in our community. And so I'm sure the, the nature of poverty was very different and probably even more widespread. Uh, but I think, you know, Duluth being an older industrial city uh, with old infrastructure, old housing uh, stock, and still, you know, a, an economy that struggles to to um, to produce uh, living wage jobs that can support these families. Mm -hmm. Can you provide some specific examples uh, of maybe organizations or, or types of programs that Ordean Foundation is supporting, where you see some real change actually being made? Well, we love the the youth serving organizations yeah. in our low. Uh, 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 low-income neighborhoods, uh, traditional neighborhoods, and so you know the Valley Youth Center sure. and working mm -hmm. with kids and and kids again that that maybe their parents are working and uh, well into the night and so they have a safe place to go and the relationships that are are uh, made between uh, the adults that are working in those organizations and those kids and oftentimes you know it's it's a stable relationship that gives them encouragement, helps them with their homework, gives them a sense of confidence. Uh, that has really paid dividends in, the, in these kids' lives. Mm -hmm. Don, talk to us about affordable housing needs, if you can. Yeah, I think it is uh, a crisis in, in Duluth, uh, and in part because of that older housing stock and the condition of, of uh, the rental uh, units in our, in our community. We have a very low uh, vacancy rate, and that, that hits those uh, low-income residents uh, the hardest. We've seen rents uh, increase uh, uh, far beyond the, the rate of increases of, of incomes uh, for, for these residents. And so it squeezes uh, their ability to, to provide, put food on, on the table and, and uh, provide for their kids uh, the opportunities to participate in, in after school activities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As you look at uh, what's being done in the Duluth area to fight poverty, do you think that organizations that are working in that uh, field of work are they doing a good job of, of balancing, giving people a hand up versus a hand out? I, I think so. You know, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that, that folks uh, are addressing their, their core needs. And unfortunately, there are so many systemic uh, uh, challenges to, to allowing that to happen. We don't pay our low-income workers enough to, to pay for the, their base needs. And so uh, we want to make sure that those families, and especially the families with, with children, have enough to, uh, to meet that. So I don't see that as a handout at all. But when they are able to address their core needs, that's then uh, provides the opportunity to start building upon that. If you're not, if you can't put food on the table or you're worried about having a, a roof over your head, it's very difficult to, to focus on yeah. homework or, or other enrichment opportunities. Don, mm -hmm. in the previous segment, we were talking about mental health. Is your Dean Foundation at all involved in providing some financial support? Uh, for good mental health for young people? You know, that hasn't been a, a focus for us. We, we do some uh, work with the Community Health Center, mm -hmm. uh, and we've done primarily dental uh, work. Sure. Although, with our partnership with the Community Health Center, we are looking at more mental health uh, issues. So it's, a, it's an area that we're moving towards because we see that the need is so acute and, and affects so many of the other services that we provide. Mm -hmm. Has it been a real different experience for you um, trying to get at some of the, the issues of poverty from a foundation standpoint versus what you were trying to do 
as a, a mayor and a politician? Well, what I really enjoy about this work is that we're, we're more focused uh, on those needs. And, you know, certainly uh, the, the uh, issues uh, surrounding poverty were an important part of the mayor's job, but we also had so many other jobs and dealing with pothole complaints and, and all along the line. And so with this job, we were able to, to really dive into the complexity of the issues uh, facing families struggling with poverty. Is Duluth more poverty struck than maybe you believed when you were in the mayor's office? Well, no, I think, you know, everybody understands the position where we are. We're on the outskirts of the American economy. We're an older industrial sure. uh, city. And so poverty has always been a, a major challenge uh, in uh, the city of Duluth. But I think I, I understand now better some of the complex uh, issues facing the families. And, and we want to kind of provide the sort of support that versus uh, a, a much more general approach that we may have taken it uh, from a governmental standpoint yeah. to get into the nuance. Mm -hmm. And how does closing the the income gaps and the opportunity gaps really benefit the entire community, not just those individuals that are, are gaining out of it? Well, it's an important part of our economy, and, and there, you know, um, we have workers who are carrying around a lot of anxiety in their lives and the anxiety of how they're going to pay the bills. And, and unfortunately in our society, it, it's very expensive to be poor. You know, there are many additional expenses that, that uh, poorer families are, are taking on when they have a late fee or they, they have some sort of fine or, um, and, uh, and so when they are carrying around that sort of anxiety, it's going to affect uh, their, uh, when they go to work and their uh, engagement uh, in, in the workplace. Uh, you know, oftentimes we see the issues of poverty kind of manifest themselves into, into conflict or, uh, or abuse or, or sometimes, uh, you know, crime uh, to, uh, to try to alleviate that. And sure. so when we have a healthier community and uh, poverty becomes less of an issue, uh, the, the yeah. entire community benefits. Don, we can't yeah. thank you enough for being here tonight. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. All right, Don Ness, the Ordean Foundation. All right. Thank you. Let's turn now to the business news from the folks at Business North. St. Luke celebrated the next phase of its campus expansion with a groundbreaking ceremony this week. The $37.5 million project includes a new emergency department, which will triple the size of the current space. There will be 37 rooms in total, including 27 patient rooms, four state-of-the-art trauma bays, and two triage rooms. The space is designed to decrease wait times and provide a premier patient experience, according to St. Luke's. The U.S. Chemical Safety Board is calling on the United States EPA to revisit a 1993 study on hydrofluoric acid. That in the wake of an explosion and fire at the Husky Oil Refinery in Superior one year ago. The board's interim executive said the Environmental Protection Agency should examine existing regulations and risk management procedures. The chemical board leader wants further research of the potential of replacing the acid with, quote, inherently safer alkylation technologies, which are being tested in some facilities around the country. The College of St. Scholastica has appointed Rick Revoir as dean of its School of Business and Technology. Dr. Revoir has served in interim leadership roles at the school since 2017. He joined the St. Scholastica faculty in 2004 as an assistant professor in the Department of Management. Revoir earned a Doctor of Education majoring in teaching and learning from UMD. The St. Paul native has an MBA from Arizona State and is a certified public accountant holding an Arizona license. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. If you have a comment on our show, call now, dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send an email to almanagnorth at wdsc.org and visit the WDSC website for our complete program schedule, news and updates about the station, 
and upcoming special events. And Julie, as we said at the top of the program, looks like winter <laughs> may not be quite over for parts of Minnesota <laughs> and Wisconsin. Well, uh, in my household, the shovels have been put away and we are letting May take care of it. You are. I have my <laughs> shovel still outside. <laughs> for Julie and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend. Good night, everybody, and be kind. We'll talk with Lieutenant Commander Roger, which one are we on? Reiner, just back from Afghanistan. The story of a deployed sailor in his own words next time on Almanac North. We're going on that one? That one. Are you fine with this, Bob? I'm always kind of messy. We'll talk with Lieutenant Commander Roger Reiner just back from Afghanistan. The story of a deployed sailor in his own words next time on Almanac North.